I'm Tom Christensen. I'm the director of the China and the World Program at Columbia University. Uh, we have a very special event today. Thank you for coming on a rainy day. Um, we're going to be discussing uh, a book by uh, Susan Shirk, and I'll introduce her in a moment. But I first wanted to thank the Saltzman Institute and the director, Peter Clement, for co-sponsoring our event today. Um, and uh, Susan Shirk uh, is research professor and chair of the 21st Century China Center at University of California, San Diego. Uh, she was formerly uh, director of the University of California's Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation, which is a nice link into Saltzman, I think, for Peter. Um, she co-chairs something called the UCSD Asia Society Task Force on U.S.-China Relations that I'm uh, honored to be uh, a member of that task force. Uh, and Susan uh, is a great leader of that program. She was formerly Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, and she is one of the most influential experts on Chinese domestic politics and on U.S.-China relations and on China's foreign relations. Um, and before I became Deputy Assistant Secretary, I tried to talk to all of the people who had that job in the past, as many as I could find. And um, I can say, and I'll, I'll remind her at dinner what she told me, Susan gave me the best advice of all. So um, she'll be discussing her truly excellent book today. One sec, I'm gonna get the book. You can carry it up here. Here is the book. Really encourage you to get the book and to read the book. Uh, it's extremely well done. And reading it, I thought of uh, I thought of Susan Shirk's MIT PhD advisor many times, Lucian Pai, uh, a, a common a friend of both of ours. Um, and uh, I thought how proud he would have been of Susan and her new book. Um, we also have a great panel today, and a lot of you want to be uh, officials in various countries. Um, a lot of the students here want to be officials. You really have great uh, role models here for being a public servant uh, on the panel. We have Susan Thornton. She is a senior fellow and visit visiting lecturer at the Yale Law School at the Paul Tsai China Center. She's also the director of the Forum on Asia Pacific Security at the National Committee on American Foreign Policy right here in New York City and a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. She's a retired senior U.S. diplomat with almost three decades of experience with the U.S. State Department and uh, working on East Asia and on Eurasia. Uh, and she served in Moscow as well as in East Asian uh, capitals. Until July 2018, she was acting Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs Hi, John. At, the, at, the, at the Department of State, and she led East Asia policy uh, until July 2018. It, when I was in the government as DAS, she was deputy director of the China Mongolia office, and uh, she was the first person who briefed me every day. Um, I would go to the gym very early in the morning, and I would be riding in a red top cab into DC or in a subway if the phone worked, and she would brief me, you know, using those fra those phrases that you have to use if you're talking about something that might be classified. Like, Remember that thing Thursday? It's working out, right? <laughs> um, and she... Uh, she survived having me as a boss for, for two years, and I can note that uh, it didn't seem to do any damage to your career, so congratulations. Uh, you know, having me as a boss didn't, didn't seem to slow you down one bit. The other panelist is John Culver, who just arrived. He's a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. He served with distinction for 35 years as an intelligence officer. Well, you started when you were like 12, right? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Just, um, he focused on China and East Asia with an emphasis on security and international relations. Um, he served as National Intelligence Officer for East Asia from 2015 to 2018 at the National Intelligence Council. He's briefed lots of top policymakers, including presidents. And I can say that he helped me mightily when I was at the State Department uh, in a very tense time in cross-strait relations that a lot of people don't really know about, which was the period 2007 to 2008. Um, and I can't uh, thank him enough for, for his service to the country and how, how helpful he is to uh, policymakers in the intelligence role. And I know a lot of you want to go into policymaking. A lot of you want to go into public service. A lot of you want to be public intellectuals. And we have Su Susan, Susan, and John here. Uh, please uh, uh, take advantage of that opportunity to learn from them. And I really encourage you to look up to them uh, as role models for your future. Um, they really epitomize. Uh, 
the importance and the value uh, of public service. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to, to Susan, who's going to talk about her book, Overreach, How China Derailed Its Peaceful Rise. Um, after she speaks, uh, Susan Thornton, John Culver, and I will all make uh, comments, and then uh, we'll have a, little, a discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll open up to the audience for questions. Um, thanks very much again for coming, and over to you, Susan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's um, a great pleasure for me to be here at Columbia with you at the invitation of my old friend and colleague, Tom Christensen. Um, I love coming to speak at Columbia when I'm in New York. Um, I One person I really miss, I wish he were still here with us, is Bob Jervis, um, from whom I learned a tremendous amount. Um, and I am glad that Jack Snyder, whose work inspired much of my book, especially the analysis of Hu Jintao's collective leadership is here to join the discussion. So I'm an old China hand. I've been studying China for more than 50 years. I was lucky enough to go to China in 71 and serve in the government, as Tom noted. And for almost all of my career, uh, China has been moving by and large, in a positive direction. So studying China has been really a feel-good experience. Um, uh, China's relationship with the United States and other countries was improving. The living standards and personal freedom of people in China was ex were expanding. And um, it was a happy story. Uh, and it was really quite remarkable that despite the, the differences, vast differences in the political systems between China and the United States, and the fact that China was a rapidly rising power and America was the incumbent superpower, uh, we managed to get along as well as we did. And I attribute much of that not just to the brilliant diplomacy of people sitting here, uh, but really to Chinese foreign policy, which was uh, restrained and aimed at reassuring other countries in the world that even as China increased its capabilities, its intentions were friendly, constructive, and it could be trusted to uh, to act in a way which would be good for other countries and good for the global order. Well, then things changed. And here's the first surprising takeaway from my book. Overreach begins not with Xi Jinping, but it begins under Hu Jintao's collective leadership. Uh, in the mid-2000s, and it begins even before the global financial crisis, which many people would say was the turning point because it changed perceptions in China about American uh, as a declining power and China as being a more successful power. Um, so what we saw in the mid-2000s, really roughly between the first and second term of Hu Jintao, is that Chinese uh, maritime agencies started enforcing the claims over the South China Sea and the uh, rocks and small islands in the South China Sea over the uh, other claimants who also, according to international law, have rights over the waters and the uh, 
rocks and small islands in the coastal waters of the South China Sea. But at the same, and this change in China's approach, by the way, was not driven by nationalism, which would have been my argument in China Fragile Superpower, the book I wrote before this. So I was really quite puzzled about that, what was going on. Uh, at the same time, we see a uh, tightening up of uh, public security over, uh, over Chinese uh, society, media, and internet in a stability maintenance drive that starts before the Olympics. But I thought, well, it's just before big events, we get a tightening up and then things are going to loosen up, but they never loosened up ever after. Uh, the state also started playing uh, a more active role in the economy after decades of decentralized market reform uh, in order to build up indigenous innovation. So this was puzzling. Why in this collective leadership system did we see the the this trend both in domestic and in foreign policy, which I call overreach. And uh, reading Jack Snyder's classic book, Myths of Empire, helped me figure that out. So I, I only have 15 minutes, so I can't really cover my analysis of the WHO era, although I assume that since the dramatic events that we all saw on video, um, now more people are actually interested in Hu Jintao again. So uh, I'm very happy to talk about my story, which is really sort of Jack Snyder's story about why overreach began under collective leadership, but I'm going to shift to talk about Xi Jinping's regime, which is very different form of party rule than Xi Jinping's, I mean, than Hu Jintao's. Um, by the end of the Hu Jintao decade, uh, as Xi Jinping was about to become China's preeminent leader, there was an open split in the leadership, a foreign crisis with Japan over the Diaoyu Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea that they both claim. And the disunity and rampant corruption under collective leadership enabled Xi Jinping to make the case for stronger, more concentrated leadership. Uh, but the party elite in choosing Xi Jinping certainly got a leader, a uh, very different kind of leader than what they expected. They never expected a leader like Xi Jinping who would consolidate power and model himself in many ways on Mao Zedong the way Xi Jinping has. And then under Xi Jinping's centralized personalistic leadership, uh, we see overreach intensified, both in foreign policy and domestic policy. And certainly the third term is likely to be even more so. We see at the party Congress that he has opted to surround himself with loyalist politicians instead of more politically independent, pragmatic politicians and abandon the age, retirement age norms introduced by Deng Xiaoping. And of course, even uh, a third term and the end of peaceful leadership succession at the top, according to uh, two-term model is in and of itself 
a form of overreach that I predict will harm China. So rather than giving you all the examples of overreach under Xi Jinping, the domestic ones, the foreign policy ones, let me just quickly lay out what I think is the dynamic in this centralized personalistic leadership that leads to overreach. It really starts with top-down intense pressure on subordinates, subordinate officials. The anti-corruption campaign, which is also a purge of potential rivals, or you might say actual and imaginary rivals, uh, that Xi Jinping initiated 10 years ago and continues up to the present day. Um, this, this uh, I'm just going to call it a purge because it looks like a purge, acts like a purge. It is a purge. Um, and what's striking about it, of course, is that they've gone after uh, high-level officials as well as ordinary lower-level officials. Uh, according to the Central Discipline Inspection Commission's own statistics, close to 5 million people uh, uh, officials have been disciplined uh, over the past 10 years. And uh, it continues up to the present in a way, in a really striking way, because the inquisitors, the officials in the discipline inspection uh, system and the public security system, who themselves did the investigations of the first two rounds of officials have now become the target of the purge. And this is what uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, another great Columbia figure, um, called a permanent purge. And it looks like this has become a permanent purge. Uh, it creates Tremendous top-down pressure on officials, a climate of fear, and uh, they need to prove their loyalty to the leader in order to survive. And the way they prove their loyalty uh, is to figure out where he's heading what his policy direction is, and then jump on the bandwagon behind him early so that they will be noticed as a good, loyal official. So it's important that these uh, officials are all competing with one another to move up the ladder. And so they need to find a way to demonstrate their loyalty. So uh, what happens as a result is that when they carry out his direction, his directives, uh, they may do it in a way that is a more extreme version that Xi Jinping originally intended. So this zealous overcompliance of policy is the main uh, mechanism behind overreach in a centralized personalistic leadership system. Moreover, the information feedback loops don't work in this kind of system because subordinates are afraid that if they tell the leader up the ladder, the truth about the downsides sides of his policy, uh, he will view them as disloyal and punish them or at a minimum not promote them. So, you know, it's really uh, quite discouraging because when we look at the implementation 
of Xi Jinping's zero COVID strategy and what the local, uh, how the local officials are behaving, it looks eerily like the Great Leap Forward. Uh, now, uh, that doesn't mean that as many lives are going to be lost as a result. It won't necessarily have the same tragic consequences, but we see this overcompliance by local leaders, the lack of feedback loops, uh, information feedback loops, and um, this is definitely damaging China in the sense that it's really harming its economy. And it's even damaging Xi Jinping because up until recently, the public was really behind him because they objected so much to the corruption of the earlier regime. But now it we don't know for sure. We have a survey in the field now, and we're wondering if the public is losing its confidence in the current leadership. Certainly, there are many people outside of China who are losing confidence in China's leadership because for the first time, we see that instead of pragmatic decision making to keep the economy humming along, we're getting decisions which are dominated not by economic rationality, but by um, the fetish for control and the notion, these myths, strategic myths about uh, the threats to China from uh, outside. So um, let me, so that's the mechanism that really drives overreach in the Xi Jinping system. And I think it's only going to intensify and get worse in the third term. She inevitably will continue to suspect subordinates of being what he calls two-faced officials. Uh, so much top-down pressure, he's never going to believe in the sincerity of their expressions of loyalty. And um, so he will just intensify surveillance, party discipline, more purges. As Mao himself advised the Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh back in 1966, and I love this quote, the more your subjects praise you, the less you, you can trust them. So Mao saw that pretty clearly, and the Cultural Revolution had a lot to do with that understanding. And uh, Xi Jinping certainly sees it as well. So um, let me shift, just make a couple of very brief remarks about what should the U.S. do about this? How should we deal with a regime that's overreaching the way China China is now. The Biden admit, well, let me just skip to the bottom line, which is that U.S. policy should avoid overreaction to China's overreach. Because overreaction, concluding that it's hopeless to negotiate any of our disputes with China, that it's already our enemy, um, will be very damaging to ourselves as well as to world peace. And instead, I argue that it's too soon to give up 
on diplomacy because we haven't really tested whether or not dogmatic rigidity is hard baked into the Xi Jinping system. And I myself am agnostic as to the question. I really don't know the answer, but I would like to see it tested. For the past six years, we really haven't engaged in any traditional diplomacy to try to resolve our differences. And it, on the US side, our own domestic politics are hardening our policies toward China. The Biden administration came into office intending many people in that group whom I know well, intending to revise the Trump administration's confrontational strategy toward China, but the Biden administration now finds itself perpetuating it instead using competition with China as a foil to try to win bipartisan support for its legislative agenda of self-renewal. So having heard both Republican and Democratic administrations inveigh against uh, China, it's no surprise that American public opinion has become more negative than ever before. But let's note that this is true in other countries as well. So, you know, the view in Beijing and certainly the view that Xi Jinping has tried to inculcate is that the United States is engaged in a, a containment policy against China. Doesn't matter how to, the Chinese government actually acts, what it does, the U.S. is going to try to trip it up, keep it down no matter what. So one re, that's one important reason that we have to engage in diplomacy, to demonstrate that that's not true, that there is still some goodwill and some openness to, re, to stabilizing relations were China Chinese government to moderate its policies. Um, and uh, the other reason why U.S. overreaction is damaging to ourselves is that the secret of American success has always been its openness. And by imposing all these restrictions on economic and technological collaboration, we are basically becoming more like China, more nationalist, fixated on security, and politicizing our own market economy instead of becoming a better version of ourselves. Openness also ensures the flow of global talents to our world-class universities like Columbia, many of whom will stay to build companies and make new discoveries. The cloud that hangs over Chinese and Chinese American scientists and engineers is, you know, discouraging them from coming to America and driving them out of America. I mean, it's not that far to move to Canada. And this is really very damaging to our own competitiveness. And of course, the collateral damage is the rise in racial hostility against all Asian Americans. So, um, I think it's, you know, my book is not really a policy book. The last chapter gives advice to the Chinese side and to the American side. Um, and 
I warn against overreactions. Uh, but what I see happening in China is truly discouraging, both for the future of lives of the Chinese people, as well as for China's relations with other countries. Um, I wrote my book, actually, with an eye to a Chinese audience. I wanted people in China to see how recent history is viewed by people outside of China and give them the information they need to try to restore the self-restraint and judiciousness of the policies that for several decades they carried out. And I dedicate the book to my colleagues, Chinese colleagues and people who've talked to me to help me understand China. So this is not a book uh, aimed at bashing China. This is a book aimed at the hope that if we understand the domestic dynamics behind China's policies better, we may be able to act ourselves more reasonably to try to restore stable relations between our countries. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I went out. That's it. No, no, it's your book, you know. So good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to have commentary by the panelists, and then we're going to have a discussion with with Susan Shirk uh, after the panelists have all spoken. And I want to ask Susan Thornton to make the first comments. Sure. Can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah, it is on. Okay. You may want to there we go. Closer, okay, I'll move it closer. Well, thanks everybody. And thank you, Susan, that was tremendous. And I just wanna say it's my great honor to be here on this panel today with three of my heroes uh, from my previous life in uh, the State Department. Susan Shirk was, uh, I was still a baby foreign service officer when Susan Shirk was the DAS in our bureau. And Tom was my boss and John Culver was my secret channel to find out everything that was going on in the real world. And uh, it's really great to be here with all of you today. Um, so, you know, I think Susan's book is brilliant. I couldn't find anything in it almost to disagree with. It explained so many things and it's so filled with something you don't see a lot these days, nuance. Um, you know, if you read the headlines right now in the United States about the U.S.-China relationship, I mean, there's a couple of memes. You know, one is that, you know, Xi Jinping is this, you know, very scary authoritarian figure that is at the sort of the cause of all of the current troubles. Um, you see memes about how the Chinese are coming to our living rooms and going to teach our children Chinese and, you know, take our way of life. Yes, yes, you see that. Um, and Susan's book basically just says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's go back and look at what really happened here. And I think that's so important because you have people out there now um, talking about the U.S.-China relationship that are saying that this was all inevitable. You know, the fact that the U.S. and China would be enemies was just written in stone. It was inevitable. And um, people like John Mearsheimer at the University of Chicago, even Graham Allison's book about the Thucydides trap, you know, people saying that these two powers were destined for war, the title of Graham Allison's book. Um, of course, he doesn't come out in concluding that we are destined for war. He has a couple of cases. He, he has a couple of cases where it didn't end up in war, but most of them ended up in war. <laughs> um, so um, so I think it's really important that we go back and try to sort of analyze what really has happened here and how did we get here? And also that, you know, there is such a thing as human agent. I mean, we are living proof up here on this panel. There is such a thing as humans being able to make a difference. And, um, you know, Tom Christensen was there. 
in 2005, when in Taiwan, the leader of Taiwan was pushing forward for a constitutional referendum. And, you know, that had the potential to erupt into a major crisis between the US and China at the time. And it didn't because people stopped it from happening. And, you know, we've lasted up until the current crisis over Taiwan, but at least in the interim, we haven't had a conflict. And people, people can do things to stop it. People do listen. Um, I'm, you know, always constantly reminded about how thick the diplomacy was during the Obama administration when I uh, was working on China and we set up the um, many, many dialogues on all kinds of issues between the United States and China on anything from green energy to saving, um, you know, sharks, um, not cutting their fins off, um, you know, all kinds of things that we we worked on with the Chinese counterparts. And it was technical, constructive, um, people working on issues they cared about. And we made a lot of progress. And um, now when you look at what's happening today, there's almost none of that human to human interaction happening. And that is, I think, a very real, uh, you know, causal factor in how bad the relationship has gotten today. So there are definitely things that the um, the governments can do, that people in government can do. There are definitely things that students can do and people to people exchange can do. And I just wouldn't want anyone to to go away from this room today thinking that, you know, this is kind of inevitable. We're bound to be enemies. I think the other question that always comes up for me when I'm thinking about where we are now is, you know, how did this happen so fast? I mean, in in 2015 and 16 in the Obama administration, I mean, let's remember in 2015, we had Xi Jinping um, as the general secretary of the Communist Party in China. You know, we cut a deal with China at the Paris Climate Summit to get a climate accord, a global climate accord that was not easily done, but we did uh, come to an agreement on that. We had uh, Xi Jinping meeting with the leader of Taiwan in Singapore in November of 2015. I mean, we almost never talked about the issue of Taiwan. And now here we are today. It's like on the newspaper headlines every day, potential war, potential invasion, potential conflict in the Taiwan Strait. So it is important, I think, also to, to look back and think, how did we get from, you know, 2015-16 when Susan makes the point that things were already getting a little bit tough in the relationship to where we are today, almost no communication. And I lived through some of that period and I'd be happy to talk about more about it more, but I do think that um, in a democracy like the United States, it should not be the case that we can go from having a constructive, thick diplomatic relationship with another major country in the world to uh, so quickly without any debate uh, among, you know, really, um, you know, people in this country, not much even really sort of focus on that this has happened to this period that we are in today where we're virtually um, declared enemies. And so I think um, that has not really sunk in for a lot of the American population that this dramatic change with almost no discussion has happened um, and that it's going to have a huge impact on all of us uh, as far as many, many different um, global issues, um, you know, institutions in the international system will be affected. And uh, as we see the evolution toward this kind of split world, I think it's really important that we all sort of take a look at Susan's book, see, see how this has, ha has evolved and try to make sure that we're not going down the course that she worries about, which is the overreaction course. So those are my initial reactions and thoughts. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so next, we're going to have uh, John Kogler speak. Thanks for coming, John. It's all right. I never assumed that getting from the East Central Park here would take 40 minutes in an Uber, so I was a little late. It's I New York City. I need to bring the mic closer. Yeah, bring the mic really close. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Um, so Susan's really given us a gift. Um, a lot of times I'm asked, hey, what books would you recommend on China? And the problem that, that I have is a lot of the current books or the recent ones are terrible. Um, they're written from an American ideological perspective. There's no sense of history. Um, what Susan's given you is, uh, you know, in a, in a, I know it may look daunting because I think it lists as 400 odd pages, but half of those are notes. 
So in a fairly crisp 220 pages, at least on Kindle, um, you can get almost the entire scope of the last, I would say, 25 years of U.S.-China relations um, from the period Susan Thornton just mentioned when um, I wouldn't quite call it a good relationship, but it was productive for both sides. Um, we could acknowledge our differences, uh, be able to manage tensions, especially in East Asia, where our security relationships and their territorial red lines tend to collide. Um, and then on global goods. Um, and then she also gives you that wonderful insight into exactly, you know, how this unfolded from the Deng Xiaoping era, the Hu Jintao era, and then into the, you know, as she noted, Chinese friends of hers called the Hu Jintao era, the lost decade. And she gives you a lot of understanding about why um, you had that view within China and then the external view of that as China got stronger, maybe confident that it became more aggressive and more assertive. And it helps you not default to the Graham Allison, not to criticize him, he's a lovely guy, he's done very well with his Thucydides strap, but this kind of reductive, you know, inevitability, because then you're you're almost talking like Chinese Marx, Marxist Leninist, you know, the inevitability of this, that, or whatever, starting with China's rise. Um, I mean, the only, you know, I, I, I could find a few, few, few nits to pick, but actually all they do is kind of amplify her bigger message in the book, which uh, if I could summarize and she can correct me either in front of you or offline, it's, you know, none of this was written in stone, that it took human agency, you know, Susan just mentioned human agency in the U.S. system. It took human agency in the Chinese system, you know, for things to work out the way that they did, that led first to the reform and opening under Deng, then the continuation and expansion of that into a real market economic system with a heavy, still heavy dose of state control, um, and then to the current, you know, kind of a hardening of the system, because they're all interlinked. Um, and uh, especially, you know, if Mao hadn't died when he did, if Deng hadn't been able to find other allies among his generation of revolutionary elders like Chen Yun, and especially people in the PLA, um, Deng's reform and opening may never have happened. Um, and then, you know, after Tiananmen Square, uh, the steps they took, I mean, in my view, and again, this is one of those nits, Jiang Zemin was the consensus choice to replace Zhao Ziyang as party general secretary, chairman of, the, chairman of the Central Military Commission, and president of China for the first time unifying those three titles since, well, ever. Um, it was because he was selected because he represented a threat to none of the key factions dominated by elders in 1989. And then he just happened to outlive them, right? They could never agree on a consensus choice of Zhang just stayed in charge. And, you know, until, uh, you know, she eclipses him here in a few years, has remained the longest serving party general secretary uh, in the history of China. Um, you know, first, you know, but it's, it's kind of a, anyway, I'll run down that rabbit hole later if you'd like. Um, similarly, you know, um, when Xi Jinping came to power, it was because of the perceived weakness inside China of, of um, Hu Jintao. And that was a hard view for a lot of Americans to understand because who seemed like a, a very, really normal and actually productive technocratic Chinese leader. You know, it's interesting when I interviewed George Bush and asked him who his favorite Chinese leader was, he said Hu Jintao, which surprised me because nobody likes Hu Jintao. He's not very charismatic. He said, no, Hu Jintao is cool. Uh, he, he's a, a hydroelectrical engineer and he loved to, Bush loved to take him to look at dams in the United States. And he found Hu Jintao actually in private, and Bush took a lot of effort to get Hu Jintao in private with just a translator and really delved deeply into things. Um, but the problem Hu Jintao had, is, and, and Susan touches on this in her book, he never was really in control. You know, you had this weird interregnum where he was elevated to the party central you know, leadership, the general secretary, and then um, the presidency in 2002. But Jiang Zemin kept the military co commission chair for himself for two more years. And then, you know, what I saw, you know, inside the belly of the beast known as CIA was he never really gave up control over the military. Um, and so you had the military for those 10 years from 2014, really, until Xi Jinping took over. Um, 2004. Yeah, 2004 until Xi Jinping took over. So more than a decade run by a Jiang Zemin clique at the top of the PLA, which is part of the reason why it became so notorious corrupt. So at the time that, you know, they were, they were picking the successor to Hu Jintao, 
Um, Xi Jinping's name elevated to the top, not because he bureaucratically knife fought his way there. It's because of who he was, you know, the, the, the son of a revolutionary elder. And especially the particular, his father was held in very high regard by people who were abused by Mao Zedong during the Great Leap Forward and, and Cultural Revolution, because he was the one senior official, and I think at one point under Mao, he was number two in the party, Xi Jinping, um, because he stood up to Mao and told him when he was making mistakes. Well, that's not a good idea to do with Mao Zedong. So he was sent to the countryside twice, I think. Um, his son was also sent to Shanxi. Um, but this consensus emerged by 2011 after culture, the uh, global financial crisis and then Arab Spring had a huge impact on Chinese leadership thinking, um, where they asked themselves for the first time since 1989, the US is backing the overthrow of all these authoritarian regimes. If the US executed a color revolution in China, um, would the army again step in to save the party? And the answer they got back was, it depends. That's the wrong answer if you're Chinese, if you're a Chinese leader in particular, because the People's Liberation Army is not the state army of China, it is the armed wing of the Communist Party. And if the army won't step in to save the party, the party will not be safe. So that's, I think, when the consensus congealed around a figure like Xi Jinping, rather than uh, Li Keqiang or somebody who kind of emerged out of the China Youth League, which Susan gets into wonderful detail on these, you know, different factions of leadership that were kind of vying throughout the over the last 20 years. Um, it's also uh, kind of symbolic that we're here today after the 20th Party Congress because the treatment of, of Hu Jintao at that final meeting uh, when he was escorted out of the hall. And uh, I've heard some stories about exactly what went down there. And it wasn't just senility on who just- Oh, it wasn't, okay. no. I can't tell. No, okay, so tell us what you got. Um, there's there's some interesting, you know, they, they had just like brought- times, that's John Coburn. Yeah. <laughs> they had just brought, I, I can't claim credit for this, but it comes from a reliable source. Uh, they had just brought foreign reporters into the hall and this, a Spanish film crew started filming immediately. And what you see is Hu Jintao, seat, he's been seated. The people who like, he, he, is, he is kind of enfeebled. So he'd been escorted to his chair, sat down. He reached over in front of Xi Jinping, opened the red folder, which has the list of the new central committee members and then the Politburo. And the agreement that he had been told they struck at these elder, these leadership meetings that the elders attend over the summer in Beidaiha was not the list that he saw inside the red folder. Um, and he got agitated because he was counting on people like Li Keqiang and Wang Yang to survive. Um, it may be, you know, prop, hopefully from his perspective on the Pulpier Standing Committee, that seven member ultimate uh, grouping at the top of the party, but at least in the full Politburo. And then, you know, maybe on the National People's Co uh, Congress and their names were not there. And that's what, he, so here you had this figure out, Hu Jintao's important symbolically because he was the last leader hand selected to succeed by Deng Xiaoping. You know, Deng did not choose Jiang Zemin uh, but he did choose Hu Jintao. Um, and uh, Hu Jintao, you know, really got his position and seceded Zhang, you know, fully by 2004 because even though Zhang didn't want it to happen, he could not take away that the selection of Deng Xiaoping. Um, and when they lead him out of the hall, it's really closing a curtain on the Deng Xiaoping era and the last legacy of Deng's stamp inside the central leadership apparatus of the Communist Party. Um, and then, you know, um, Xi Jinping's speech, and especially the full text, which I don't read Chinese, so I, you know, rely on good translations. It, it's very dark, you know, uh, they, they stopped using a lot of phrases that have for the last 25, 30 years have been core. And Susan gets into this, you know, the decision to adopt um, the idea of reform as a benchmark of Communist Party policy. You know, and the idea that China was was experiencing a period of strategic opportunity, which mean meant that the external environment would remain relatively stable. China didn't have to worry about fighting a major war. And even Deng Xiaoping's dictum, which enabled reform and opening, I think he uttered this in 1978 or 1982, that peace and development were the dominant trends of our time. Um, Xi Jinping is now either watering those down to raise the specter of more fundamental struggle for the Communist Party, so they can't assume this benign environment. And, and really, at, then at the core of Susan's book is, well, of course they can't. They're, they're, they've been overreaching. You know, it's, 
there, there, was a, there was this real sense of hubris that would have made the ancient Greeks blush when China, after the global financial crisis, was announcing its plan called, you know, first the semiconductor industry strategy, which was going to toss $160 billion to become completely self-reliant in semiconductors, which would be the only country on the face of the earth to do that. So that was an immediate challenge then to our semiconductor industry and those of Korea and Taiwan and Japan a little bit and, and Europe. Uh, and then this Made in China 2025, you know, another mag just over, overwhelming act of hubris that they were going to achieve a leadership role in what they viewed as the technologies that will dominate the future. And not just semiconductors, but artificial intelligence, quantum computing, computing, biotechnology, just a whole wealth. Now, paradoxically, now, when you look at the Trump and Biden administration, American revitalization plan, they're the same technologies. So the Chinese were right, but it was bad form to brag about it and claim you're going to dominate them by 2024. So, you know, I really recommend this book. It, it's got just a wealth of history and a very readable condensed form. And then, uh, you know, and not to detract you, though, from her personal experience, you know, the, the first time I met you in person, I think you were at State Department. I came in to brief you. And it was always a little daunting to brief the East Asia and then China Mongolia desk at State, because unlike some of the senior officials you would meet, they actually knew what they were talking about. So you wouldn't be able to just dazzle them with backstory. And, uh, and then their questions tended to be simplistic. Susan always asked very tough questions things that she knew CIA probably didn't know and had to go find out. Um, but I also saw a clip of you on the Dick Cavett show, oh, yeah. I think in 1971, when you had just returned from your first trip to China. So I haven't been stalking you, but I've been sort of admiring <laughs> your career uh, since since before you came into government. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a sad story in a way, because she's telling you about the opportunity China had and then how they, you know, through reaction to the paranoia, the very paranoid view by which they always seem to view the United States. You know, if you if you can look at, you know, President Obama and see a Machiavellian figure who's unleashing the deep straight to state to overthrow the Communist Party, I, I'm afraid the problem's probably not President Obama, it's probably you. The same with George Bush, you know, and one of the, the artifacts, that it, it's in there, she doesn't choose to highlight it is, it really doesn't matter sometimes what the, what the origin of U.S. policy was. You know, it, it, it might just be things the president said for a domestic audience here, like our expectation that we could peacefully evolve China by admitting them to, by supporting their entry into the WTO and, and supporting free trade. Um, but we are, you know, in their view, we are always out to get them. She notes that Chinese leaders then and to this very day believe that we deliberately bombed their embassy in Belgrade, Yugoslavia in 1999 even though we admitted it was an accident and paid reparations for the three lives lost in the Chinese embassy, they believe it was uh, an attempt by the U.S. to destroy sensitive military equipment that the Yugoslavs were storing in the, I mean, none of it makes sense, but their willingness to believe that, their willingness to believe that we're behind the Occupy movement in Hong Kong, willingness to believe that the U.S. supports um, Xinjiang terrorism, justifying their you know, incarceration for, of millions of people. It's it's the one of the saddest parts of this, and it, it does lead to that problem Susan Thornton mentioned, where um, there's there's kind of a sense in the U.S. in both the last current and last administration of there's no point in talking to them; they're going to believe the worst anyway. And I would just kind of reinforce what both Susans have said, which is don't give up on you. You may want to give up on Xi Jinping, although you can't afford to, because if nothing else, we need to be heard. We don't go there to make friends with him when we meet with them diplomatically. We go there for a clear articulation directly from us and not mediated by the press of our concerns and our views. Um, they can't be filtered out. Um, but also don't give up on the Chinese people. You know, uh, the 400 million Chinese entered the middle class over the last 25 years. Um, it's staggering. I mean, their middle class is bigger than our population. You might quibble about definition of middle class. Like the last full year before the pandemic, 200 million Chinese traveled abroad. That's amazing, you know? And every one of them who went overseas on a student visa or a tourist visa or for business saw the world through their own eyes, not interpreted for them by the Communist Party or Chinese media. And the thing is, well, Susan and, and Susan Thornton and I and Tom, Tom can bemoan what's happened over the last 10 years you know, remember that the Chinese remember what it was like in 2007, 2008, 
when they could say things on the internet, when there was no great firewall, um, when they could express a concern over local corruption or environmental degradation um, or labor rights standards and all these other issues. And they, they more than anyone know what they have lost over the last 10 years. No, this quote. Thanks a lot, John. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I always say that the biggest victims of the things that we criticize are the citizens who have to live under that government, not uh, American foreign policy. But um, so, uh, Susan, I, you, you've got a lot of praise, so it's going to be hard for you to respond uh, to the comments so far. So I'm going to play the my geeky role as a as an academic and actually ask you questions to which you'll have to respond. Okay. okay. So I have I have three questions. They're a little bit lengthy uh, because they're structured questions. And my first is uh, about uh, your reference to uh, my mentor and friend Jack Snyder's book, Myths of Empire. And you portray two very different sources of overreach for the Chinese government and its foreign policy and its domestic policy. And... Um, you portray a collective leadership that was designed uh, by Deng Xiaoping uh, to, uh, um, long before Xi Jinping's rise to power, um, to create a kind of group leadership, a collective leadership to prevent the uh, excesses uh, that he remembered uh, from working under Mao Zedong, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. And if you had a collective leadership, there'd be kind of a check on those types of excesses. And that seemed like a relatively good idea, but this created a dangerous log roll, you argue, along the lines of, um, of Jack Snyder's Myths of Empire, because there was no uh, top leadership to guide everything, and the different uh, power centers pushed their own selfish initiatives, and the, ex the result was a log roll, a resultant that produced a more aggressive uh, Chinese policy than you would have uh, you would expect under a unified leadership. So that's problem set one. And then problem set two is Xi Jinping. Um, he's a very powerful leader. He doesn't have those checks on power. Um, he could go a lot of different ways with his power, but um, he decides to push a very assertive uh, nationalistic agenda, and there's really no check on him. And now that's the new problem with overreach. And I guess from a comparative politics perspective or from a policy perspective, you know, what's a communist to do? Um, <laughs> um, you know, is it, is it just, is it a problem with a one party state that you're never going to have the right balance between too much power in the hands of a single individual or too little power in the hands of a single individual? And do you need all those civil society networks and free media outlets and all the other things that Jack Snyder loves so much? Um, and you know what, what would what would your advice be? Is it better to go back to the lost decade of Hu Jintao than to go into this brave new world of, of Xi Jinping? So that's my first question. My second question is: since President Xi is going to be around for a long time, and John alluded to this, as long as his health remains strong, we're stuck with him. So what are we going to do? Um, uh, you know, Susan, remember, we crafted a phrase in the in the second term of the Bush administration that the United States strategy was to shape the choices of a rising China. Right? Shape the choice. We, we talked about what terms we were going to use. We, it was like a real Chinese teapot. It was, it was, you know, and, and we came up with it. And someone said, it's condescending. And I said, well, it's better to be condescending than to be belligerent. So, <laughs> so we have to, well, let's, let's choose condescending. And we went with shaping the choice. And, you, and your book says we should still be doing that. You know, don't give up. We should have diplomacy towards Xi's China. We're stuck with them, sure. Um, and you said that uh, you know, a combination of, uh, of diplomacy of combining threats, assurances, and carrots um, might actually work in shaping the choices of Xi's China, um, and the jury is still out. Uh, but we do have some evidence, and I'm a little bit more optimistic maybe than, than John on this score, maybe even than you. We have some recent evidence, um, and uh, we know from our UCSD Asia Society Task Force that you head, uh, that when Russia invaded Ukraine and the PRC refused to condemn uh, Putin's invasion and blamed the United States and blamed NATO for the conflict, uh, many Americans said we should be sanctioning both Russia and China massively. They're together. It's an alliance. It's very clear. He made his choice. Let's just do it. Level the sanctions, weaken China because they're in, in bed with Russia. Russia is obviously aggressive, so China's 
obviously aggressive. And then some of us said, no, no, let's try coercive diplomacy instead. Uh, we should um, threaten sanctions against China if China backfills the sanctions on Russia. And we shouldn't level the sanctions on China if, if China doesn't backfill the sanctions on Russia on items like semiconductors. And I know you're at San Diego, so I'm going to focus on semiconductors. And the Biden administration, to its great credit, chose the approach, that uh, the latter approach, I think, because I was an advocate of that latter approach. Um, and it appears that it has largely worked to date, that China has not violated uh, the sanctions uh, of the United States and the EU uh, under threat of secondary sanctions. They haven't backfilled those sanctions on Russia. And that was the, that was the ideal outcome. Um, and it seems like coercive diplomacy works. Now, th here's where it gets complicated, and here's why the question is complicated. Subsequently, the United States has placed export controls on certain types of advanced microchips to China relevant to artificial intelligence. And those measures are not fundamentally new. Don't believe the hype in the, in the newspapers. We always had export controls to try to slow down China's military modernization. That's not new. What's new is there are new things on the list, right? But when you put things on an export control list, this is what political scientists uh, like Glenn Snyder and economists like Thomas Schelling call brute force measures. It's not contingent on the behavior of the target. You're just trying to keep the target weaker than it otherwise would be. China can be as beneficent as you like. We're not going to give them the AI chips because we don't want the Chinese military to have the advanced weaponry that can be made with those AI chips. Right? At the same time, we're involved in course of diplomacy, which is something very different with China on Russia, saying, if you sell microchips to Russia, we're going to punish your microchip industry terribly, and you're going to pay a, a, a huge economic cost. And I want you to assess this situation. These things seem to be run, the logic of, 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 of brute force is very different than the logic of course of diplomacy. And these things, if the, if the list of the entity list and the export control list grow related to microchips, it starts to undercut the assurances in the course of diplomacy towards China on the Russia issue, because China's industries are gonna be hurt whether they help Russia or not. So why not help Russia? And I just wonder, you're in, you're in San Diego, which is like the second Silicon Valley, right? I mean, it really is, you're in the chip land, right? right? Right, Qualcomm and all that. So so I'm wondering how broad do you think these export controls will be? And at what point will they undercut your diplomatic effort? Which I think uh, you, you've prescribed it, but I think it's been more successful than you suggest uh, to date, at least on Russia. And then the last piece is really something that John, the last question is, your grand strategy about the United States is about building a stronger, more competitive, and more successful democracy, right? And that will show the world that our system works, and you know it'll maybe undercut the arguments that China's system is the best way to go. Um, and you say that in this process, the United States should not become more like China, but it appears that both parties in the United States now want to do things like industrial policy. And I take you back to San Diego, and I ask you. Uh, you interact with these uh, these innovative companies that create the technology of the next the next century. Having worked in the U.S. government um, and having lived in the center of U.S. technological innovation, how do you assess the ability of Washington to actually guide industrial policy and guide uh, economic development? Um, and what federal government policies might actually help? And what federal government policy might actually do more harm than good in this effort to compete with China through industrial policy? So those are big questions. They're long questions, but they're, I hope they're integrated and they make sense. And it puts you on the spot and allows you to speak more, which I really want you to do. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Tom, for those really incisive questions. Um, the first question about what's a communist to do um, is really a question that I've struggled with when writing the book. And in terms of social science analysis, it's the one that I ag really agonized with because ideally I would like to compare the two different decision-making systems and then get some uh, variation on my dependent variable. 
but instead I get a kind of convergence on my dependent variable that the behavior is, I mean, both systems are producing overreach by two very different dynamics. Now, the more concentrated personalistic dictatorial system is, uh, you know, uh, is overreaching more. We get a tougher internal surveillance police state. Uh, and it's not just about the technologies of surveillance. It's also about mutual watching, which is really um, passed down from the Mao era or even before. Um, and in terms of uh, foreign policy, it's also more aggressive than it was before um, under collective leadership. So, I mean, if, I, if I'm a communist and I have to choose, I'll choose collective leadership. But I'll choose collective leadership that uh, is more balanced in terms of the interest group representation. And, uh, you know, in the Hu Jintao era, the control, what I call the control coalition dominated. And of course, within the party, uh, industrial interests still continue to dominate. So, but we know that interest groups like private business, uh, coastal provinces that are more integrated in the global economy, more cosmopolitan, middle, the growing middle class that John Culver's just been talking about. You know, we know that these are important interest groups, but the problem is they have no voice in the Chinese political system at all. And, you know, uh, Jack Snyder and I have had an online conversation about this, which is how could Hu Jintao have sustained his first term direction of a really headed towards some kind of more democratic socialism? And we know that influential political figures in the party were talking about this. And we know that politicians like Wen Jiabao and uh, Wang Yang, and to a certain extent, Sung Ching Hong, were publicly talking about it in a way that was kind of trying to appeal to those groups. So that tells us that there was a latent coalition to balance against the control coalition that existed because the politicians see it. Mm -hmm. But Hu Jintao and those politicians didn't do anything to really provide uh, avenues through the political institutions to give that latent coalition a voice. Well, what would it have taken to do that? I think what it would have taken would be something in the National People's Congress to strengthen China's legislature, just as other autocracies have mm -hmm. uh, gone in that direction of Taiwan, too. Yeah, of strengthening the legislature, give these the latent work. Oh, no. Yeah, we had one before, just before you got here. I think we're a really thick, dense, dense Um, Thanks for coming back. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, we passed the emergency uh, system. Uh, we have been cleared for the future. We hope not to have another fire alarm for the next five years.
Um, so Susan was answering the first of my three questions, and I think she was pretty much completed with the first answer. Um, and that was that, uh, you know, collective leadership is better, but there should be uh, better institutionalization of public voice in the, in the system. Um, then uh, I had asked a question about the trade-offs between the uh, limited brute force uh, strategy of depriving China of AI-related chips because they're military-related for future weapons, like automated weapons in particular, and the course of diplomatic strategy of threatening to sanction Chinese companies if China were to violate the EU, US, Japan, South Korea, and Singapore sanctions on Russia. Um, and then the third question was, can, can, can the government that you worked in control through industrial policy the people you hang around with in San Diego? <laughs> uh, well, just very briefly, because I really want to hear the questions from students who are so committed, impressively committed, that they came back to the room. So, um, you know, the dominant approach is the sanctioning approach. And what the coercive diplomacy is, um, was undertaken in a conversation between Xi Jinping and uh, President Biden, as I understand it, who made it clear that we would be prepared to impose sanctions similar mm -hmm. to what we were doing to Russia if China gave tangible support to Russia. And uh, that, and in fact, apparently they had plans to help that we may have known about. So I, I think that is the exception rather than the rule, that the way we've been operating now is more imposing costs on China, trying to trip it up, slow it down, instead of using it as leverage in some kind of diplomatic process. So that's what I'd say about that. Industrial policy, you know, I don't really have uh, a lot of expertise in this area. I do know that I remember during the period when we were competing with Japan, we sought to model our uh, industrial policy on Japan's. And then in the end, the U.S. method, which is much more market-driven and flexible, uh, you know, beat out Japan. So I'm not a big fan of industrial policy, but I'm not, if it really is money going to some areas and setting up some R&D facilities. I'm fine with that. That's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, picking winners is not a good idea. Thanks a lot. So we have a microphone in the middle of the room. Um, people can ask questions. Um, and I only ask that you identify yourself uh, so that uh, we know with whom we're speaking. Uh, I know a lot of you, but uh, my other three panelists may not know you. So uh, introduce yourself briefly and ask your question. Everyone's tired from climbing the stairs. Yeah. Go ahead, come to the microphone. Uh, thanks very much for this talk. Uh, my name is Xiao Nang. I'm the uh, current fellow at the China and World Program. Um, so like um, my question is that like, uh, I am very convinced about your like argument on the sources of overreach. Um, and my question is, um, can you talk more about, do you think whether there are still sources within or outside of Chinese party state can slow the overreach? Like, because you think the overreach begins <clears throat> since the uh, whose area, but before that, like China acting a way of cons constraint. Uh, 
Um, do you think those sources still exist even today? And, and a related question is that under the personalization of Xi Jinping's power, China is still a fragmented like bureaucracy. There are still a lot of bureaucrats and local government, especially the middle to lower level uh, officials. And facing a top-down pressure, like one reaction is to jump on the bad wagon. Like another reaction, and we have seen, especially after the anti-corruption campaign, is that the middle and lower um, level officials, they could be risk averse and not doing anything. So, so do you think there are still any sources like in this middle or lower level bureaucracy that they can slow down like the overreach? Thanks. Uh, great, great questions. Um, I, I do think that uh, sort of passive resistance occurs as well as overreach in overcompliance. I think they both occur and it really depends a lot on how high a priority the policy is and whether or not the agents, the in this principal agent relationship feel that they can get away with passive resistance. But there's been a lot said from the central government, including by Xi Jinping himself about implementation problems. So I think the passive resistance do as little as possible is certainly still, you know, that's kind of the classic mode in China because people don't have a way of really articulating their interests more overtly. I mean, I remember, I don't think any of you were there. I'm, I'm the oldest one here. Um, but uh, a conference that Mike Oxenberg organized back in 19, oh gosh, I can't even remember, in the 80s, I think on the, um, uh, the articulation of interest in China, looking for interest group politics. And the main conclusion is that this sort of slowing down, easy rider, not uh, like free rider uh, pattern was the most prevalent. Your first question was, can we from outside China? Well, that I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I do believe that we need to speak not just to Xi Jinping, but to the other politicians around him so that he so that at least they know that if there were some moderation of Chinese policies there was, there would be an opening to stabilize relations and that would be good for China. At one point I say, you know, I think a stable relationship with the United States should be a core interest for China. You know, they talk about core interests, which are mostly about sovereignty issues, but then now it's sort of bled into COVID uh, policy. Well, I think essential to China's own national security as well as its development is a stable relationship with the United States. So I'd like to find ways of articulating that to the people surrounding Xi Jinping, even if they, uh, because Otherwise, his strategic myth about how we're determined just to slow them down uh, will, you know, that'll be truth to them. And I have to say, watching recent actions by U.S. policymakers, you know, it increasingly looks like an out-and-out -out containment policy. Hello, um, my name is Todd Etheridge. I am a graduating, uh, sorry, 
Hello, my name is Todd Evers. I'm a master's of international affairs student here at SEPA who will be graduating this fall. And after that, I'll be working in the Foreign Service as a public affairs officer, Great. hopefully in the AAP region. And um, <clears throat> my question today is regarding engagement with China. Um, and the, current, the stance that both the Biden and the Trump administration has taken is almost placing them as their enemy. Um, you know, traditionally, there is often a factitious relationship between the deep state, academics, track two uh, diplomats, and then um, the electorate who makes the actual policy decisions that determine how we move forward with the country. And I'm curious to know, what are you all thoughts on, because the point you're saying of us having to re-engage, like it's important to have engagement with them, even if we don't agree, I agree with that totally. But how do people who are bureaucrats or academics who have a more nuanced understanding have an influence on policymakers who seem to want to take hard lines in these hawkish positions um, in a time where it seems like we are growing more polarized as a country. I mean, I think the points are great, but how do you get that into action? Well, actually, I see a little bit more of a debate in the policy community about China policy, some really good statements by people like Jessica Weiss's foreign affairs piece and um, and so uh, I'm hopeful that after the midterm, there could be something of an opening, but what's more likely is that Republicans will be stronger in the both houses, possibly having majorities in both houses. Um, and then that will, I mean, that will create more of a partisan situation, but sometimes bipartisanship or this effort to achieve bipartisanship that President Biden has made can be a formula for lack of debate, lack of discussion of costs and benefits of policy. Everybody's just, you know, on the same track. So it's conceivable you might get more debate in a more partisan environment even. I'm I would just sure. say that it's also not necessarily true that the electorate is necessarily of the same view as this elite political debate, right, about China or not lack of debate. I mean, I think you can make the case to people that there should be discussion between China and the United States, that seems, I think, pretty obvious to the average people that live, like, in my neighborhood in Maine. So I think it's it's also a matter of, like, leadership to, to just make that case directly and say, hey, of course we have to talk to China. You know, it's a big country. But sometimes that's difficult in the politics of the moment. And, right? and one of the things that seems to work, at least in, you know, in public sessions that I participated in uh, with people who aren't all academics, um, is to say that the great source of U.S. strength vis-a-vis -vis China is uh, the U.S. relationship with allies and partners around the world. And uh, if we alienate our allies and partners with too simple of an approach to China, we're actually weakening ourselves when we deal with China. And as long as you can you know, pitch it as, what's your goal? Your goal is to be very strong in the face of a potentially aggressive China. Then you need to keep your allies and partners on board. And they're not, it's not going to be easy to get them on board for a zero-sum kind of containment strategy. So to make ourselves strong, we need to engage and we need to be diplomatic, if only to impress these other parties that if China drops the ball on that, then they'll be more likely to join us because they'll know we tried. And I think we've done that with the Russia piece. That's one of the many reasons I was opposed to those who were advocating direct sanctions on China now because China didn't condemn Russia. Because even if you want to sanction China because you believe China will backfill the sanctions on Russia, it will be much more effective to do so after having tried because you'll do, be able to do it multilaterally because the other countries will see that we tried to offer them a way out and they didn't choose it. And the actual sanctions on China will be much stronger than if you didn't try the diplomacy first. And I think that comes out well in the book and I think that's how you do it. And on the Chinese side, for Xiaonan's question, you know, I always think that diplomacy is better done out of sadness than anger. So, you know, you have to recognize that any Chinese government, even a liberal democratic Chinese government, is going to want 
to improve China's position in the world. They want to make China more respected, greater. You know, they have the whole century of humiliation. So you say, okay, you want to be stronger and greater. You're not getting there through the methods you're, you're using. Look at all the pupils of all the advanced economies in the world. China's reputation is as bad as it's been in my memory, and it's getting worse in the developing world too. The new polls that came out this week show that even in the developing world, China's reputation is going down. So you say, look, I understand you want national rejuvenation, but this isn't how you get it. Rather than saying, how dare you want national rejuvenation, which seems to be the, the language in, in Washington. How dare you want to be strong? That's revisionist. That, that doesn't work. That wouldn't work with any country. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I'm Sam Shi. I'm a senior in the dual bachelor's program between Columbia University and Sciences Po. Um, so I'm originally from Taiwan, so I'm very interested in cross-strait relations, of course. And so I was very interested in the task force um, report that was re recently published. But I think still there's a question about implementation, but also long-term goals, right? So on the implementation front, Obviously, it seems like you guys seem to dissuade um, uh, Congress people from voting for or even pushing for measures in the policy, uh, Taiwan Policy Act, specifically those more symbolic ones, right? Um, I, I guess like my question on that front is how do we reconcile this dual message that we're sending, right? Because I don't think the Biden administration actually wants ROC to become ROT. Um, but at the same time, the legislature is pushing all of this rhetoric. And it seems like in the past, maybe in 2008, as Professor Christensen had experience with, um, there was at least a unified sense in the executive branch that, okay, we're not going to allow Taiwan to become ROT. We're going to dissuade them from that. But now with U.S. policymakers saying we do want that, with the Taiwanese public ever so much more believing that they are Taiwanese and not really Chinese, and it seems like this whole idea, this whole national goal of Chinese um, reunification, quote unquote, um, is essentially dead in the water um, in reality. And so, number one, in terms of implementation, right, how do we actually make sure that U.S. policymakers aren't sending or policymakers aren't sending dual signals to Taiwanese policymakers who may be more encouraged to take a more green, a more independence leaning stance? Um, how do we I guess make sure another Tsun Sui Bian doesn't come about who's actually serious this time, who has more support from America, from the Taiwanese public. And then on the long-term scale, um, I guess it's it makes sense to keep things with strategic ambu ambiguity, with making things um, in, in a way that ensures that ROC is going to, ROC, quote unquote, Taiwan, is going to continue in its present form. But what's the long-term goal? What should America's long-term ambition be, right? Because they can't really say we're going to recognize ROT, but they can't just abandon Taiwan. Um, I don't think that would go down, you know, with any uh, politician. I don't think any politician would actually advocate for that, right? Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on these two matters. Well, <laughs> I defer she, to she, Professor she, Christensen. She knows, she knows I wrote the first draft of that, that report, yeah. so because I did it for Susan, by the way. Um, <laughs> The, the process, no one knows how the sausage is made for these uh, task force right. reports. The sausage is made like this. I speak up at a multilateral meeting of the task force and say we should we should be you know making clear messages about Taiwan. And Susan says, good idea, Tom. Why don't you write a paper on that? <laughs> and then I say, no, I can't. I'm really busy. I've got 100 things to do. And then I go home. And since I was raised Catholic, I feel really guilty. And <laughs> about 30 hours pass. And I say, it's, tr it's true. I could never say no to Susan Shirk. And then I write the, the, the draft. That's that how it's so nice. <laughs> so, and I, so the world benefits. So, I don't know about that, but I, <laughs> so so you know the, the the way you describe it is is accurate. That you know what is the long term goal? And we used to say in cross strait policy making that uh, we would be good in the United States with any resolution of cross strait differences that was acceptable to people on both sides of the strait, including the public in Taiwan. And that last public piece was a was a Clinton administration uh, innovation, probably done by Susan Turk. I don't know, but it was a, it was a good in, innovation because because Taiwan was no longer an authoritarian state; it was a democracy. So you had to have the consent of the Taiwan public, um, and we meant it. We really meant it. You know, if for some reason the mainland was to, was to become so attractive to Taiwan that Taiwan public actually was not opposed to unification. <laughs> 
or if the mainland had become so flexible, and there were people who were flexible in the past. I've been studying cross-strait relations my whole adult life. There were people in Shanghai and other areas on the mainland in the past who had very flexible formulations for how Taiwan and the mainland could get along in some kind of loose federation. And as long as no one said they weren't Chinese, it would be fine. And Taiwan would have real autonomy, not like Hong Kong, but real autonomy. There were people who, who wrestled with those. Those people are, are gone. So my view is what the United States strategy should be is to return to that resolution position and kick the can down the road. Tell, make sure that Xi Jinping never wakes up one day and says, you know, Xi Jinping never wakes up one day and says, today's the day I want to scrap my entire diplomatic portfolio and put my economy at risk so I can use force to settle cross strait differences. As long as every day is not that day, you're kicking the can down the road. And I think we can do that through a combination of a very strong military posture and a much more flexible military posture in the region and constant assurances that the purpose of that military posture is not to promote Taiwan independence. And we've done it before. And one of the things I worry about most in Washington, and it doesn't come out so much in, in Susan's book, and I, I wish that, you know, if I had one critique, it would be this, that, that it's really important for all of us who worked on policy uh, you know, you can't say, I can't accuse you of working on policy. I'll get no. you in trouble. Um, but, but, um, but I had colorful ways of telling them they were stupid. But I used the intelligence. <laughs> so, so one of the most dangerous misperceptions in Washington these days is that our China policy and our East Asia policy for the last 40 years has been a failure and it needs to be fundamentally re reworked. And I think by any historical standard, you know, you've talked about power transitions a la Graham Allison. Our East Asia policy and our China policy has been a tremendous success. There have been zero wars involving China since 1979. China has sovereignty disputes with almost all of its neighbors. And there's been zero wars. And you would think the whole world was on fire when you listen to congressional discussions of our China policy. Oh, you wimps, you screwed up everything. You destabilized everything. And it's just not true. So we need to figure out what went right, and we have to understand that it's going to be more difficult to succeed in the future because China is a lot stronger, and for all the reasons she lays out in her excellent book, a lot more difficult to deal with. But that doesn't mean what we did in the past is a failure, and it means we have to you know, work differently and smarter to try to produce the same results. And I don't hear a lot of that in Washington, and people are very willing to say, no, no, don't, don't, don't. Don't defend past policy. Let's just talk about policy now. But you have to defend past policy if you're trying to sustain past policy. And at a foundational level, I think we should sustain. We, we never disregarded China's military modernization in the past. We always cared about it. What was called the pivot to Asia really started in 2006, before the surge in Iraq. We were very much tied down in Iraq. But most of the elements of that military readjustment happened then. I was in the government time, I remember it. And it wasn't some kind of jerky action. It was just a recognition, China's rising, we need to have more leverage out there. And it wasn't in their face. It wasn't saying you don't get to grow, but we're gonna be stronger too. And let's not fight each other because it'll be a disaster for everyone. So, anyway. There's a paradox that Susan touches on in her book. She, she talks about half of it. It's when China decided that the world was out to get them. Um, and it, it started, you know, it, it's always been there. It's deeply buried, you know, Marxist Leninism, especially the cynified Marxist Leninism of the current regime requires threats and enemies and a hegemonic adversary to oppose their rise. It, it, it's, it's not quite as hard boiled as fascism, which actually requires war, but it's getting close. Um, so right around the time that people in the U.S. were saying that we had 40 years of failed policy because China did not peacefully evolve and politically reform, despite opening, uh, you know, that, inviting them into the WTO and helping integrate them into global economic discourse. Around that same time, the Chinese were concluding that we that uh, that peaceful evolution was working, that they were overrun with foreign affiliated NGOs. There was too much free expression, and what starts out as a online debate or blog about environmental degradation or land reform or something will turn into anti-regime measures at some point. Um, it's just, it's always struck me as very strange. We, we were failing, but they were sure we were winning, you know, kind of argument. 
And it used probably reminded me before I retired in March of 2020, I pulled up a paper that I helped write in 2008. So right around that 2006 timeframe where we forecast what the People's Liberation Army would look like in 2020. And we were almost exactly right. So you can call what the PLA is doing impressive. You can call it dangerous, but don't say you were surprised because we were informing policymakers for a decade of what was going to happen by now. And they, for various reasons, especially in the Pentagon, chose to decide they had other priorities. If I can sort of like follow up on um, the first question I had about like, how do you stop the immediate flow, right? Um, because I agree immediate with- Immediate flow of what? Um, not flow, sorry, the immediate- um, domestic support for Taiwan as Taiwan and not ROC. Um, because I agree with both of you in the sense that, like, you know, clearly there are strategic ways to approach this, right? I, I think kicking it down the road and hopefully, <clears throat> you know, China democratizes or something like that. Um, ideally, that occurs, right? But I think for the same reason why, you know, the U.S. wasn't able to simply abandon ROC, if there does become a time in the future where there is enough support for Taiwan as Taiwan within America to the point where we can no longer say like, oh, yes, let's continue to uphold the ROC name, even though Taiwanese people don't want that. How do we, how do policymakers deal with that, right? The executive branch, <clears throat> State Department obviously doesn't want that, but how does how do you sort of like translate that to the legislature and tell them you so, know so Sam I, I just there's a lot of elements to your question yeah. and they're not really accurate like the U.S. doesn't okay. say ROC we we we're not allowed to say ROC in the right, government right. right so um but that's what they want but it's to not really, I don't think anybody I I I, don't, I think I can speak for people I don't think anybody here thinks the United States should be micromanaging identity politics in Taiwan about how people in Taiwan feel about themselves the problem is whether they act in ways that harm Taiwan's own security and thereby harm U.S. national security by taking political actions that flow from them. And that's when we step in and say, no, we're against that. And the public should know that because the public knows that the United States is a big factor in Taiwan security. And there you say it again, out of sadness rather than anger. Like, we want you to be secure. We have worked for decades to make you secure. You're making yourselves less secure by doing this. It's stupid. It won't work. It won't move the ball forward for what you're trying to pursue. I understand what you're trying to pursue. You're not going to get there this way. You're going to cause a war. And who's going to suffer most in a war? Well, you know everyone's going to suffer. The United States is going to suffer. China's going to suffer. But the one thing that's certain is Taiwan is going to suffer. And that line that has now been attributed to Shelley Rigger, I've been saying for years, which is all Americans love Taiwan. Some Americans want to love Taiwan to death. You don't just support them no matter what they do if they're doing something that's suicidal. Uh, hi, um, my name is Max Mayo. I'm a SIPA student here. I study international security policy and specialize in East Asia. Um, my question is about, I guess, <laughs> politics and mobilization. So a lot of the tension in the US and in China um, the adversarial um, tone to the U.S.-China relationship is very advantageous for both domestic uh, political regimes. And uh, how much of the status quo and just how this is going to evolve do you uh, think is maybe related to that and less about the actual foreign policy thinking? For example, like, um, like it's very easy to get bipartisan support for various legislation in the U.S. to you know, have a tough line on China um and that could be stabilizing uh whereas if you don't what do you organize around hey, you talk about this in the book right you have this this great section where you talk, say everything that you want to do in politics in the united states right now if you can link it to competition with china you can get it through the congress right we need better we need a better subway system in new york why because there's a good one in shanghai right. and shanghai can't have a better subway they than new york subway gap. right there's a subway gap right <laughs> Sorry. Well, yeah, and uh, <laughs> President Biden, to his credit, you know, really did believe that he was one person who could achieve bipartisanship in the U.S. Congress. Um, and he, even Joe Biden, despite all of his years in the Senate and all of his good friends on both sides of the aisle, he couldn't do it. The margins are so small, you know. But I don't think 
I mean, what you're suggesting is, oh, it's always uh, good for domestic politicians to bash an external enemy. Well, yeah, at one level, yes. But there are big differences. And different interest groups really are a lot of the key. It's not some undifferentiated mass of the population. So, um, you know, I think that's an important difference. And the institutional arrangements within the political system are also important. Peter, you get the last question. I, for human rights reasons, we have to let the panel Please. Thank you. Uh, first, thanks to all of what a fantastic panel. Uh, so I'm a Russia person, and I have to ask at least one question about China's relationship with Russia. So several years ago, uh, Gene Rumor, a colleague of mine from CSIS, uh, coined this phrase, the bear hug is real. And so I'm wondering, in light of events since the invasion of Ukraine, the second invasion of Ukraine, do you feel that China is in a much stronger position in this relationship and the little hug is getting a little tight for the Russians? Or do you think that we have now potentially a source of real tension that could become a problem down the road for both parties? I think Susan Thornton is the best person <laughs> to... She worked in both countries. It's, yeah. very rare. it's a rare thing. Yeah. What a disastrous Everything. diplomatic career. I worked on China and Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Look where we are now. How come, um, get, how come you get Spain and Italy? I don't know. I don't know. Too easy. Too easy. I like hard problems. Um, look, I really do think that the China-Russia relationship, you know, it was called at the beginning sort of a marriage of convenience. Um, you know, maybe it's a little bit more than that now, but I still think there are fundamental distrusts there um, and fundamental kind of irritations and and suspicions that um, will prevent them from ever becoming that close. Um, and, you know, you see it kind of playing out a lot, I think, um, where they certainly don't want to challenge each other. They want to, so, you know, be seen to be having each other's backs. They have this common um, antipathy toward the U.S. hegemonic world order, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of things that Putin says that Xi Jinping in his inside voice is thinking, yeah, that's exactly how I think, but he's not going to say a lot of those things out loud. Um, and, you know, there is a certain amount of better chemistry between Xi Jinping and Putin, I think, than there has been between previous Chinese and Russian leaders. But I still think... Um, you know, that it's going to be very hard. I mean, certainly their economies are quite um, symbiotic. If they can ever get all that infrastructure in Siberia built, maybe that would, you know, make them a lot more um, permanently attached. But I just, uh, you know, the Russians are so um, kind of disdainful, <laughs> frankly, of the Chinese, um, even in spite of their modernization and how well they've done economically, et cetera. And, you know, there's a lot of other places where there are tensions. I mean, if you just look at what's been happening in Central Asia at the recent SCO summit in China, I mean, Xi Jinping went to Kazakhstan first before he went to the SCO. So, I mean, the Chinese take advantage of all these little ways in which they can, you know, um, tweak the Russians, but without presenting any kind of open front where they can be directly criticized. And I, I just think it's a kind of a permanent state of affairs. I really, you know, they're doing a lot more militarily, but is any of that really kind of decisive in moving either side forward? It'll be interesting to see how the Ukraine thing develops. And I think, you know, in some ways the jury's still out as to how bad the U.S.-China relationship will get, and then on the flip side, you know, what happens between China and Russia, and I think those are related, but I still think it's it's never going to be an alliance. You, you've heard me say this before, Peter, but maybe the other people in the room haven't, that I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February, that that version, that, that chapter of the invasion, because it's been going on for a long time, um, is a disaster for China, and I can't help but think that they're frustrated that uh, Xi Jinping stood up there with Putin 
declared best friendship. No limits. And, and uh, with no limits. And Putin used China in that way because it's really harmed China's reputation around the world. COVID has, this has. And, and with the Europeans. With yeah, the yeah. Europeans, are like this, this 15 plus one or 16 plus one that China was trying to build in Eastern Europe, throw it out the window and you can't distance yourself from Russia invading Ukraine because Eastern Europeans really care about that. So it's been a disaster for China. And China's also in the crosshairs for what could be devastating sanctions. And I don't think she wants Putin to, fa to fail. So it, it's going to become increasingly tempting to try to backfill some of those sanctions and put China in trouble. I think they must be terribly angry. I mean, look at China's friends. They all they ca just caused China trouble. North Korea, <laughs> Russia, <laughs> right? Crappy. With, with friends like that, who needs enemies? Right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks, and thanks for sticking Thank it out and coming yeah. back upstairs. I really yeah. appreciate it. You it all get a medal. This was our big event because, you know, Susan's so special and we yeah. get this great panel. So thanks to everybody. Yeah. Really. Thanks, thanks to all of you. I'm happy to sign books if anybody wants to buy one. I would like to buy Oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. How do I buy your books? <laughs>